Well, hello there, PMO community. My name is Laura Bernard. I am the host of this fishbowl session. I am one of the top 15 PMO influencers, according to the PMO Global Alliance, and I am honored to introduce to you two of our top 16 PMO leaders of the year from the PMO Global Alliance. So Marcelo and Michael, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. So I'll let everyone know a little bit about me and then gentlemen, I'll have you introduce yourselves and we'll dive in. So I, like I said, I'm Laura Bernard. I'm chief impact driver for PMO strategies. And I have been a part of the PMO community since 1999 when I built my first PMO, uh, having no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I learned a ton along the way. And I spent 15 years in the role of PMO leader uh, before starting PMO strategy seven years ago because I kept finding myself saying to PMO leaders, gosh, I wish I had me when I was you. And, and after getting to know Marcelo and Michael, I just love, love, love their stories, the great successes they've had. And I cannot wait for you to meet these fabulous gentlemen and learn more about their journey and exactly why they made it to that top PMO practitioner list. Because to me, it's obvious when you hear their stories. So with that said, Marcelo, would you care to tell the audience a little bit about who you are? Sure. Uh, my name is Marcelo Tocci. Uh, so I, I work at Embraer, um, the program's PMO and uh, deputy program director. I've been here at Embraer for 21 years now, so, so I'm a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've learned a lot uh, since I got here uh, 21 years ago. It is a journey, quite a journey. And I was lucky enough to have, you know, to be here on the shoulder of giants. So uh, lots of people, uh, uh, mentors and, and teammates and everybody else that would, you know, help me tremendously to, to go through this journey and, and learn and, and try to help as much as I can. Uh, so uh, we, we could get where we've got. Um, I believe that I'm here, you know, representing a team. Um, more for most, the, the generations that came before me uh, and, and the team that we have today, I am. And uh, they're the ones that, that you know, got this award. Uh, and I, I do believe that that's, that's uh, a lot of our culture as well, right? Uh, we're, we're a team. Uh, we, we love what we do here in terms of uh, what we do in terms of uh, project management, program management. And the last thing that we got was... Uh, the PMI Project of the Year Award, among cool. other, uh, yeah, uh, among other uh, awards, and uh, that was beautiful for us. It was the first for us in Brazil. Uh, it was the first for an aircraft uh, project uh, from any any country. So mm -hmm. that was a huge honor for for all of us. Uh, and uh, and uh, well, this. It's probably why I got here. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a great that's a great introduction, Michael. How about you? Yeah, thanks, Laura. So, Michael O'Connor with uh, Medtronic, and I'm out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, at our operational headquarters. I work in corporate science and technology, and um, I'm a research director slash director strategy project management. So, I basically manage uh, very distant technology uh, projects and programs. Um, I, uh, I've been in the med device field for about 30 years, and um, I have a, a PhD in uh, civil engineering, majoring in project management. And we actually, as Medtronic, we just won uh, the Product Development Management Association Outstanding Corporate Innovator Award. So a big award. Oh, wow. We're actually having a webinar here coming up uh, on that award. So a lot of great things happening here and um, glad to be here today. That's awesome. All right. Well, let's just dive in. So we agreed that one of the great things that we could talk about that we know is impacting all PMO leaders and project practitioners out there is adapting to thrive in times of chaos and beyond. And that's certainly something that we've had a lot of this year <laughs> is chaos. And there's a lot of things that we all had to do to adapt in our organizations. My students certainly have gone through a year of transition and change. And we were hoping that maybe we could share some of your insights as practitioners in this space, what you had to do, what it looked like before you know, the 2020 year that it's been and uh, how things had to evolve. So we'll start at the top, which is, 
just tell us a little bit about what your PMO looked like before 2020, and then we'll talk about the changes that needed to be made. So Michael, do you want to start for us? Yeah, sure. So, um, so our PMO before all the changes happened um, was pretty well established, and I'm talking about a PMO in uh, R and D. Mm -hmm. And so, the PMO in R and D is across our global organization of 100,000 people. So, in other countries, other places in the United States, um, and we had a, a good structure in place, and we've we've got our processes, and we've been going this direction for quite a while. Mm -hmm. I will say. Six year, almost six years ago, we purchased uh, Covidian. So we went from 42,000 people to 100,000 people six years wow. ago. We're still reeling from that a little bit, and that's still impacting some of our PMO work. But the, the net net is we, we've come together. We have all these PMOs. Um, the R&D group is doing a lot of really good things, and, and we're having some success. Um, since March, um, I would say I haven't seen – a lot of change. We've been able to pivot into this virtual setting. Um, I think most of us were ready for this or had enough um, experience in this area. So I think the company did a really good job. But one thing that happened for us is uh, we had WebEx as our primary tool. We pivoted during the pandemic to Zoom. And so now <laughs> we're ex exclusively in Zoom. And at that same time, we brought Microsoft Teams in. So yeah. we had some changes there. But I would say from a broader PMO perspective, we've done very well and we've kept things together and people have been organized. Probably the biggest thing that has been a change for us though is we're not having the face-to-face -face interactions like no one is having, um, but we're doing these through the virtual interaction and, and we're, we're making headway, but we're still trying to peel that onion and figure out how that's gonna work in the in you know the longer term. It's only been seven or eight months. So, sure. um, so that's kind of where we're at right now. That's great, that's great. Now, Marcel, how about you? How, what did your PMO look like before and were there any big changes that you had to make? The interesting thing is, is that it was a matrix PMO, right? So we, we were uh, a program management organization. Um, yeah. And then inside of that, we have a, a lean philosophy inside the company. So there was a continuous improvement itself, which uh, actually worked as a PMO, which I led. Uh, and uh, the uh, we had a small team, like 15 to 20 people, which is really small. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, a program as big as, as developing a, a new uh, jet from 70 up to 150 seats mm. uh, is, is a lot of VUCA. You know? <laughs> it is. It is really, really complex. True, you know? It's like yeah. only inside the had like more than 2,000 people working at the same time. And then yeah. when you get to the supply chain across the planet, you know, US, Canada, Europe, Asia, Brazil, uh, work thousands of people working at the same time at the same project and and it's high tech so you know uh, you're, you're developing something that uh, that nobody has ever developed before so there's right. a lot of volatility a lot of uncertainty a lot of complexity a lot of ambiguity and uh, and uh, it's been part of our history it's not the the uh, it's the latest one so as as we evolved, from the E1 to the Phenoms, which are executive jets, to the Legacy 500s, to the KC 390, uh, which is a, a defense uh, cargo plane, uh, we were learning and learning and learning and learning. And uh, and then when we got to the nature, we got even more lessons learned inside different VUCA environments. So right. when we got VUCA at the maximum with uh, COVID, right? Yeah. We were ready. Uh, and, and we actually deployed a uh, corporate uh, PMO, so, and, and I actually went there to help as part of the even smaller team of this, this PMO, so we could uh, have a crisis management team and, and, and have a quick response to the crisis. Right, right. And, and as well, a plan for the future. So that connects with uh, strategy maps and uh, and link with the entire company and that links with culture as well, which is another point that I'll, I'll bring later. Yeah. So it's really interesting that you mentioned VUCA because when all of this was happening for you know, more globally, as opposed to a localized uh, pandemic, it was becoming a global pandemic. I was meeting with a lot of PMO leaders that were in panic state and uh, you know, and I started hosting these weekly free trainings, just open the public, you know, Zoom meetings. Hey, let's talk about what's going on, what you're concerned about, you know, and how to address the challenges you're facing now that this pandemic is here. And the thing that I explained to them was, listen, this VUCA thing that people were talking about before the pandemic, you may have seen a blog post or a webinar you didn't have time to attend. That stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. 
Yeah. Which of those things is not on every single project you've ever been a part of, right? I mean, exactly. that's literally, we are the masters of VUCA. We know how to take all of that, you know, chaos and make order from that chaos. And what is really interesting that we didn't talk about in advance, it's interesting that both of you being, you know, top, you know, PMO award winners, um, both of you said, yeah, you know, I got this. We had changed, but it was not that big of a deal. And I want to point out for the audience that that's a really important factor here is that you gentlemen and your teams inherently understood that VUCA is a part of the, the way you run your PMO and adapting to thrive, which is the topic we're talking about here, is all about being able to pivot when the needs of the organization pivot. So it's interesting that you mentioned that because again, we didn't talk about that in advance and both of you are, are saying, yeah, you know, we had to make changes, but you know, that's the world we live in. So I think that that is an interesting dynamic that also matches my experience with my students, for example, those that had their seat at the table this year, those that were um, called upon to help drive change in the organization in the midst of chaos, like you two gentlemen were, all of most my students, for example, they were getting those phone calls because they already intuitively knew how to meet and the needs of the organization and pivot. So very interesting that you brought that up. And I, we're going to definitely dive deeper into that because that is a trend, a theme that I see with successful PMO leaders. They have the uh, knowledge, skill sets, strengths, and, and frankly, mindset to be the the solution the organization needs, that strategic business partner to the organization, no matter what kind of change is happening. So I'd like to dive into that a little more if we can. And, you know, before we dive into what you had to do to respond to the pandemic and what that looked like, I'm curious to know when you were setting up your PMO or as you're um, implementing PMO services in your organization, you know, pre-pandemic, did you face a lot of change resistance in your organization trying to bring new services and capabilities to bear? And then we'll talk about what things look like uh, post pandemic. So Michael, why don't we start with you? Did you face any change resistance? Sure. I mean, there's always resistance to change and change is the constant. Um, but yeah, we, we, we faced, uh, you know, resistance in various ways and, and areas. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing is easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't be there. Right. I, I wouldn't say it was significant, but, it, you know, it, it depends. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, this this large company that we bought and trying to integrate it with the with yeah. the uh, legacy company. So there's always kind of things going on there that's resistant to to things um, that were done, you know, prior to this uh, this merger um, or acquisition, I should say. But but again, it, it hasn't been significant. Um, um, it's it's been pretty easy to uh, problem solve and to get through uh, things. But the one thing I've seen post COVID is, you know, there's just a lot of movement of people of different leaders and then they take a different role. So we're always kind of doing the same sell job to other other leaders and other groups. Mm. So there's nothing that stays too constant for too long. So that's right. something that I see in my organization. I don't know if Marcelo, you see that same thing. But um, mm. one of the things I wanted to mention too is, uh, you know, during this pandemic, we changed CEOs. So we had a CEO for yeah. nine years that was very successful as a PhD with electrical engineering. We went to a new internal CEO in May and uh, you know, that transition has been really smooth, but you didn't know at the time. And of course we're going through a lot of structural changes right now, nothing to do with COVID, but you have that on top of everything else. Talk about change. Uh, yeah. there, there, there's a lot of change going on. Yeah. How about you, Marcel? Were you hitting pre pandemic? Were you hitting any resistance to the PMO or the services and capabilities you were rolling out? I know you're in a matrix PMO and that yeah. can sometimes make things a little bit more difficult, but it's also yeah, I mean, common. Yeah, it's a matrix inside the company and it actually ends up being a matrix outside of the company as well because we're, you know, integrating with suppliers across the planet. So, right. yeah, you, you know, you're you're working on a different management model uh, and you're trying to make it even better. Uh, so people that are not used to it, uh, sometimes it just resists uh, because they don't understand. So one of the things that we did was we tried to um, run analogies of uh, trying to explain to different cultures, what is it that these guys are thinking about and how, how does that play into my life? And uh, critical chain, for example, and, and theory of constraints was something that we were applying lots and evolving as mm -hmm. for 20, more than 20 years, I think. We're, and uh, it, it's hard to explain to people that don't 
really had a chance to get to know that. And uh, we were using analogies, uh, like uh, an analogy that we were using for uh, athletes. Yeah. Saying that uh, we should behave as leaders, uh, you know, as a coach, and, and not as something somebody that is a demanding customer that is asking somebody to deliver something at that specific moment. We're there right. to support them. And that's a huge different uh, mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, you know, until people realize that's good and they feel like it's good and they practice and, and they start to believe that it's really good, you find a lot of resistance. It's part right. of the deal. It right. is. Yeah. Well, and so interestingly, and I'm going to throw, I'm going to kind of throw a little monkey wrench into this at all, um, just to, just to have fun with it. Um, I have a different take on change resistance after having been in your shoes for 15 years. And then, you know, through my consulting and training company, I believe that resistance uh, to change is actually not what we're facing because I know a lot of people that do change to themselves all the time. So I don't actually believe in change resistance as much as, um, you know, needing to look at how we go about implementing the change because, you know, and when I, this is funny because I always say to people, do you believe in change resistance? Everybody puts their hands up. People are resistant to change. Everyone puts their hands up. Right. <laughs> However, you know, then I, then I say, Hmm, do you know anybody that's gotten married <laughs> or <laughs> got a kid on purpose? We do change to ourselves all the time. Right. But what we don't like is having change done to us. Right. And so, this pandemic was a perfect example of change being done to us that we didn't welcome. And what I found really interesting, and that's where I want to go next with you guys to see what your experiences were like. What I found interesting is that people adapted to changes very quickly, despite how much they didn't want to, because they realized that they had to, right? I mean, we all went virtual overnight, you know, Michael, you're talking about how you switched to zoom overnight so that you, you know, could collaborate differently. You added teams. People can adapt to thrive, I believe, when the right motivating factors are there for the change, when they understand the change, when they are part of that solution, like it or not, right? And so what I'm really interested in hearing now is um, what you guys needed to deal with when it came to pivoting as a result of the uh, pandemic. Did you have to change the way you worked and what role did your PMO have in helping to um, pivot the organization in the midst of chaos? I know Michael mentioned a couple of things related to needing to go to different technology. Marcella, what was your experience like when the pandemic happened and changes started to need, need to be made overnight? What was your experience as a well, PMO leader? Well, uh, I, I was detached to um, a uh, corporate uh, strategic uh, PMO, right? So, um, so you know, as, as commercial aviation, which is one of our business units, mm -hmm. and uh, and we needed to set up a crisis management team, mm. and ah. uh, and and that was great because we, yeah. you know, change, right? Again, we're adapting to change. We're we're actually reacting as fast as we can to to this new scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we structured that in a way that could be uh, the more beneficial for the entire company. We try to seize uh, the opportunity behind that, right? right. So uh, uh, yes. health uh, first, right? Making sure right. that everybody is healthy and, and everybody's okay and safe. Uh, we work a lot in, in preserving the cash of the company, which is was key, and mm -hmm. and it's you know a standard approach for everyone. And then we started to connect on, with the future and uh, and update our strategic plans and uh, and start to connect with everyone and, and as we speak. So that that's really important because uh, you're starting to show to everyone that um, there was something that's changed. There was a reaction that we all participated and worked so uh, we could respond to that. And there are beautiful opportunities behind it. Um, so in this links with the culture, because, uh, Peter Drucker used to say that you, you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, culture eats strategy, uh, on breakfast, breakfast. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And, and, and it's, it's really true. It's, it's amazingly true. Uh, if you yeah. have strong culture in your company and, and the PMOs need to be aware of that yeah, and, and help and influence that as well. Uh, no matter how good your strategy is and how you're going to deploy it, it's, it's not going to work. 
so um, yeah, if you, need to, if you feel like that that's good. That's an opportunity that's going to happen. We're going to make it together. Uh, Embraer culture uh, has uh, has evolved and keeps evolving. Right. One of the mottos we have is that we live for the challenge. So every time that something like this happens, oh, we live for the challenge. So that's a really interesting point about the role that you guys had in culture and in, hey, Michael, um, and, and, and being a part of the change and the building a culture of change that's, you know, adaptable and flexible and, you know, embraces change. So that's really interesting. So, Michael, I'll ask you the same question I asked Marcelo, which was now we're now we're into pandemic mode and your PMO is clearly um, a catalyst for change or a supporter of change, driving change in the organization or an impact driver, as I like to say. So what did you need to do um, or what role did your PMO play in helping to kind of pivot and transition uh, the teams, uh, whether it's related to the culture or working behaviors or shifting projects and programs around, as well as then we might as well feed into the next question, which is how did you talk to your leadership team about what role you could play and where you could provide value? Because I think that's a really, there's two parts to that, right? Like PMO leaders want to know what did you do? But then also the hard part is how do you have the right conversations with your business leaders so that they know you are there and ready to serve and able to help them through this crisis. And then Marcel, I'll ask you that second part as well. Um, so initially how we uh, we embraced this whole uh, pandemic is we're a global company. So we saw this coming from China a little bit earlier. I yeah. reported at that time to the chief medical chief scientific officer. So we were getting some intel earlier. But with that being said, um, it, it still it still hit us kind of out of nowhere. Right. Right. Uh, but, yeah. but what we did is we pivoted really interestingly. We were making ventilators. So ventilators at the time when in March were a big deal. We were making yeah. ventilators out of Galway. So they actually had a plan. They created a PMO and, cre and and made that PMO even bigger to go from 200 ventilators to like 1,200 a week. I think wow. that's five times the production level now. So that was one of the things we were focused on. I, what leadership did, and again, we had a new CEO at this time. Um, so the new and the old CEO were working together. We decided we can do these things really well and these things we can't do as well. Yeah. Um, so, so with the ventilators, they did create that PMO. They looked at that. They they adjusted. They pivoted. Um, we were working with outside partners like SpaceX and Tesla, Elon Musk. We were working with the uh, University of Minnesota. I could go on and on about that, but we right. we actually decided to do an innovation challenge. It wasn't a PMO, but it was kind of close to a PMO. And we set up something that we've never done before so quickly to get all the ideas from people on PPEs and things that we could do. So we did actually utilize our 3D printers across the globe to create PPEs. We worked with some other universities. We decided which projects fit our sweet spot. So we, we did that in a portfolio or a PMO way, but we didn't call it a PMO. Sure. And really that was that was uh, led out of my boss. And, and then at the same time, I got another boss. So a lot of change happening. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that was really um, a good way to pivot. And, and we've got a lot of good kudos from uh, anywhere from the president to the governor of the state and whatnot. Um, but, but really we didn't, we just didn't call it a PMO. We were doing a PMO though um, in, in essence. Right. And, and can you repeat the second part of the question? I, I don't remember that. Full yeah, part. sure. One second. So I think that's a really important point that you bring up though, about the calling it a PMO or not calling it a PMO. Sure. Um, that's, that's a really important thing for folks to remember. We don't have to get caught in the name. And in fact, when we're assessing our organization to find impact opportunities, I often, I have a health assessment that I take PMO leaders through. And part of that process is to find PMO like activities happening in the organization because they'll often find that the things that we think of as PMO services and capabilities are happening in different parts of the organization already. They just don't call it that. Marcelo, that sounds familiar to you, right? Yes. Yeah. And Absolutely. that's yeah. and that's a really interesting thing that I when you you guys are dropping all these value bombs. So I'm just kind of pausing to make sure that they don't get missed by our audience because these are important um, uh, details, right? If we get caught up in the name, what it's called, it has to be PMO or nobody likes PMO. So we're going to call it the strategy realization office or the strategic implementation office or the transformation office. It doesn't matter what you call it. It matters how it's driving impact across the portfolio of initiatives 
or investments as your business leaders are thinking about them, right? And that's one thing that I noticed when I first met you two is that you both think and talk like business leaders. You think about the outcomes you're helping the organization achieve, which is really important. So speaking of business leaders, the second part of that question was how did you talk to your business leaders about the role the PMO could play? Or Michael, in your case, it sounds like there was also another PMO set up essentially to to do that so it sounds like they value the pmo and what it can do for the organization can you talk a little bit both of you about any kind of conversations you have with business leaders or guidance you have for our pmo leaders listening on how they can have conversations to not sell the value of the pmo but talk about ways that you can provide value in the midst of chaos and crisis and well beyond um, and, 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 so I'll, I'll continue on this if that's okay. Um, yeah. So our, our leadership, again, I had a new leader and uh, I wasn't trying to sell him on PMO. I, I, you know, I, I find at my company, when I talk about program, project, PMO, people get confused. So it's more about what can I do to get the outcomes that you need? So I focus on outcomes, uh, getting there. <laughs> it's not like you said, it's the vernacular okay. and definition. It's not as important. Yeah. Um, so I, I try to be careful since I am kind of the project guy at Medtronic, I try to be careful not to go down that. And that kind of gets me into a, an issue if I start talking in th those terms. So that, I think that's a great point you brought up, Laura. Um, but true. I was in a fortunate position that I got to work with that leadership of the ventilators and other areas to help organize some of these things. And I was having discussions with the chief medical officer and our new boss. And um, again, w when it came to what can we do, everyone after two weeks, the first or the last two weeks of March, they're wondering what can they do? What can they do? We feel helpless. Well, right. setting up this innovation center in a virtual way and saying, hey, if you have ideas, put them in there. That was really our portfolio, right? And then we looked at that portfolio and we took a VP and said, you're the head of that portfolio. You and your team takes those ideas and creates, you know, which ones can we work on? Which ones are can't we work on? What's in the best interest of Medtronic? And they quickly did that. Again, we didn't call it a PMO, but they right. quickly did that. And they said, okay, here's our top 10. Right. Our number out there. And here's how we're going to go about that. Here's how we're going to do it met with the CEO, you know, he had accessibility the whole time, actually both CEOs. And, and just to be honest, our ex CEO is still a part of the company and very involved. So that we're pretty lucky, but cool. le leadership was very involved. And at the same time, which I think was very important for this innovation work or what a PMO would be in my mind is the leaders were creating weekly video messages for all the, all the people at the company to watch and understand oh, that's what's nice. going on. That was huge because of the change in CEO, um, we're getting a lot of notoriety for the ventilator work and people are like, well, what else can we do? So that along with um, those leaders having those video messages along with working with those leaders, I thought we adapted and we pivoted really well to what we can do and what we can't do. We told partners and people that were talking to us, sorry, we just can't do it. We're not, we're not experts in making face masks. That's not what we're going to do. We're not going to try to do that. But right. um, again, our leadership, I thought was, was well organized. And we didn't call it a PMO, but we went down that route to get the ideas and the things that we could do really well. And we executed on that. And we're executing on that right now. Now, before Marcelo, you answer the question, again, more value bombs thrown out there. I just want to make sure people pick up on. Michael, you talked about how you get yourself in trouble if you basically talk PM speak to people, right? And that's one thing that I warn my students about all the time. Do not shove a bunch of PM speak at your business leaders and your stakeholders because when you see those eyes glaze over, it's because they have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> or do they need to know? Nobody's going to love this PM stuff as much as we do, right? Yeah. However, you know, what they do care about, you you hit the nail on the head with the outcomes. They care about the conversation of outcomes. And Marcel, I saw you going, yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Perfect. tell me your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I know. First of all, perfect. That's it. And it's it's multicultural. You know, yeah. with our suppliers across the planet, I can tell you it's you know, it's it's universal. <laughs> so yeah, don't don't get don't get you your PM talk. Yeah. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> but it's for our fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're the PM geeks. We have to talk in business speak so that we can be so we can have our seat at the table, right? They want yeah. to they want to know that you understand the business, that you get them, that you understand their pain points, right? So, Marcelo, talk to me about how you engage in those conversations with your business leaders and what advice you have for our PMO leaders listening. Well, we, um, I guess the first point that I'd like to raise, you know, uh, Michael was, was, you know, just you said perfect there. And uh, is, is, again, related to, to culture because um, 
-hmm. You know, you went through a COVID crisis and you, you got out of it. So next time you're having, getting through some problem, always remember that. Right. So what we're doing today and, and now is, is, is going to help us foster our culture and, and inspire the future generation. So when they get to problems, they can look back and say, whoa, that was, you know, that was even harder than what we're going through now. So we'll, we'll fix away. Yeah. So that, that's really important. On the leaders, um, we always talked about that um, uh, as part of a core team and as part of a governance. So having a, a clear understanding of a governance is very important because when you're starting to manage your stake, internal stakeholders and you are starting to influence them, it's very important to have a very good picture of inside and outside of the organization, who are your key stakeholders mm -hmm. and start to build trust with them. And one of the keys is the outcomes. Yeah. Yes. So when you start talking about them, about the outcomes, what you're going to help deliver, what you're going to lead and everything else, you start to, to have a bond with them so they can become real sponsors. Mm -hmm. And that's make, that makes a huge difference uh, for your mm -hmm. projects and, and PMOs. Uh, so, um, and the other thing is be simple, yeah. <laughs> right? Sometimes you just get, you know, lots of data, lots of information. Again, it's for our fun, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as geeks, right? PM yeah. geeks. Yeah. Uh, you should always be very objective, very simple, very straightforward when we talk to them. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and that helps a lot because next time you're going to get to them, they'll listen to you because you were simple. You brought something that was really important for their business. They are leading. Mm -hmm. and, and this relationship will start to get into a virtual cycle. Mm -hmm. So that, that is really important. Getting this feedback, constant feedback is very important. And, and this is exactly what we did for the E2. So we had uh, Luis Carlos Afonso as our uh, sponsor in the beginning, which was uh, our sponsor for the project uh, of the year award um, as recipient and Fernando as, as our project uh, program uh, director as project leader so uh, we all had this bond we we were there talking every single day and, and making sure that we were addressing the right problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is a daily relationship it's not like you yeah know, you're you're every once in a while you just show up no it's it's real it's it's uh, daily uh relationship yeah, that's that's another element which is really important you need to be close mm -hmm. very close mm -hmm. so, so you like, to, sorry i'd like to make one, one comment on the simplicity so i couldn't agree enough our new ceo that's his mantra is is simplicity you take the complexity out of things i want to know uh how you can make processes and actions and things more simple and project management can do that right he doesn't yeah. know that yeah. but he's, he's speaking our language as a business guy, again, I'm not going to go up to him and say, hey, you're being a PM by what you're saying. But simplicity is also important. And I was just on a call with Sunil, uh, the CEO of PMI today, and we were just talking about that simplicity thing. And even PMI needs to get to more simple uh, uh, you know, vernacular and definition about who they are and what, where they want to go. So I, I think you hit it right on the head, Marcelo. All right. You know, that's a really, again, all these great value bombs. I want to make sure our audience is taking notes and uh, writing all this down because one thing you guys talked about there is something that I see consistently. We'll have uh, for years now, I've talked to PMO leaders who get so frustrated that their business leaders can't make decisions. And then I say, let me ask you a question. You ever get in one of those meetings where they're down at the bottom of page four of the status report you put in front of them, they're stuck on that one piece of data down there in the bottom of page four and you can't get them to make a decision. Like, yes, all the time. Why are you putting a four page status report in front of them? You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Why are you giving them 14 different things they need to make decisions on and 25 metrics that they have to weed through to figure out what's really going on. Keeping it simple is huge for helping them actually comprehend what they need to comprehend so that they can make a decision for you. So again, you guys are, um, you know, I swear, it's like you're, 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 you're preaching to the choir with what I'm always telling my students, that this is what success looks like for a PMO. And you guys 
are clearly what you, you know, you won your spot in the top 16 of PMO practitioners of the year because you get this stuff intuitively and it is represented in your behaviors. So keeping it simple is super important. Streamline, optimize as much as you can, make it easy for people to engage in the process. I'm sure, um, that this will resonate with you guys. A lot of times I'll go work in, I'll start working with a client and I'll say, tell me about your intake process to take on a new project for your portfolio. And they'll show me that the 65 steps that you have to go through in order to engage the PMO. And I said, well, that's why you're having trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to make it easy. You guys talked about speaking, the language of the business, building relationships, which I'd like to dive into a little bit more in just a second. We've talked about the simplicity, uh, making it easy for them to make decisions, make it easy for your business leaders and your stakeholders to do what they need to do, tell them what they need to know, then stop so that they can respond. So that's a really, really important point you guys are bringing up. Let's dive a little into this relationship aspect because I could not agree more. Um, Pre-pandemic, I was always advising my PMO leaders to spend a significant portion of their time on a weekly basis building relationships. Because like you said, Marcelo, it's not just when you need something, you want to be constantly building that relationship. So I would always say, hey, go have a coffee, go take a walk, go take them out to lunch, do happy hour, whatever you need to. And you can still do things like that creatively uh, during the pandemic, even if everyone's distance. But it is important to continue to strong, build strong relationships throughout the entire process so that when you need something, you're 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 asking somebody that you've got a strong relationship with already and they already know enough to help you right in, implicit in what you guys were saying which i'm making explicit for everybody watching is that you keep that you keep the information flow simple but continual right neither of you said it but i know that's what you're what you're doing right you keep that information flow continual and the engagement continual so that they always know what's going on with the pmo they always know what's going on with the programs and the projects so that when you need something because they trust you because they're informed they know how to respond right so can you guys talk a little bit about what that cycle looks like this virtuous cycle of continued um conversation connection what you're saying to your business leaders how you're um, engaging them in conversations how you're getting and keeping them involved because i know that's something our audience is going to want to know um, so go ahead marcel you can start go ahead, marcel. okay thanks um so as part of the program we have a very very clear understanding of what uh, delivered value to our customers and we validated that since day one since we right. started the development of the airplane and uh, and that was the foundation of it. We we had a clear understanding of what were the benefits. We um, and and that was what everybody was looking and working for. Mm -hmm. So once we were doing that, uh, that was the standard information that we would talk with our uh, business leaders, right? Mm -hmm. They they were and our sponsors. That was the mission we got. That was the mission we we were going to deliver. So uh, having a very clear and good understanding of that and uh, is, is very important. Yeah. The other thing is, and I love this quote uh, for uh, you know modern times. Thank you for the information that you have not provided to me. <laughs> That's good. Right? It's amazing every single day, you know, tons of, of info, right? Yeah. Uh, so we always try to manage by exception as to if something was not going well uh, or was trending not to go well, then we would uh, just warn that something was going on and we would uh, talk with them, get support if necessary, or just tell them, hey, I got it, just for your knowledge, and uh, I'll keep you posted. So that that's important. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that then you start to build a relationship on this foundation, on benefits, a yeah. clear understanding of what are the uh, business results. That's great. That's great. Michael, how about you? Yeah, this is an actually an area that I've learned a lot in the last seven or eight years. Um, I often thought uh, project managers do your work, put your head down and, and don't look up. Um, there was a point in my career that someone told me, hey, no one knows who you are. You need to get out and meet people. So I actually created a, a, a slide and I'm ha happy to share it with anyone, but just a four blocker slide that says, who do you know? 
how are they high influencers, low influencers? Yes. Um, how well do you know them? I did an inventory and I, I noticed I didn't have the people where I wanted to have them. So I reached out to some of the executive committee and I started building the relationships. I take probably five to 10% of my time, my week uh, doing that to keep things moving along. And you don't know who you're going to need when you're going to need them. You need right. to have those people and have the trust built because if you don't have that trust, when a time comes to having something good or bad and move it quickly, they're not going to know who you are. That's not going to help you. So I've right. been coaching a lot of people in my company to do better networking and reach out to people. And actually now is a good time for everybody and everybody watching this to create kind of a, a list of people that you want to get to know. And maybe it's two levels up or three levels, you know, the CEO, why not? If you have something to say and it's worth the value, you should, you should be going and talking to them. But really for PMOs, project people, you got to have a, a list of people that you can count on. And it's mm -hmm. always changing and evolving because people are always coming in and coming out. And I spend a, a time on that. I have a, a Visio chart and an Excel page and I keep my one-on-ones with them and I decide how I'm meeting with them monthly or, or quarterly. And I can't tell you how much that has helped for all the projects I've been involved with uh, at the company I'm at now. And sure, it helps. I, I report to an executive right now or I had, um, but still you have to keep constantly invigorating that and changing that because you don't know what project you're going to be on or how big it is going to be or how small or what roadblocks you're going to have. You're always going to need people to help you. That's the key. It's people. Right. It's, you're just a person, you're a leader, you're leading a project, but it's all the people that help you. And it's those stakeholders that help too. It's it's a quite a complex network system. So it's not just as easy as say, I'm going to go meet with these two people. Right. Have to kind of think through who are the people I need to meet with that will help me get where I need to go on my project and maybe even in my career. So I think that's something we could talk a lot more about, but that's at a high level kind of what, what I, uh, what I think about it and how I go about it. That's great. You know, uh, when I was, when I was inside organizations as a PMO leader, uh, one of the organizations I went to work for, and you know, I, I had the same mindset early on, just go get it done, focus on the results, drive, 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 get stuff done. And I had it right with the outcomes focus and what we need to accomplish and all that. But I then interviewed for a job that required me to go through 16 interviews and yes, 16 interviews and a psych evaluation. And they still hired me. Um, <laughs> and, and it was, and I still didn't quite understand how important relationships were in that organization until I was there working for a while. And my boss had to say to me, and I heard it from a couple of different, um, uh, executive leaders in the organization, we value relationships more than outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I was blown away, Miss Impact Driver here. I have been an impact driver my whole life. And here I am being told that relationships matter more than the outcomes. Now, most organizations don't say it, but they lived and breathed that in their culture. And once I understood that, I said, okay, so tell me what to do. And I had a lot of the same advice you need to invest in building those relationships. And for those of you that are saying, oh my gosh, it's such a waste of time. I have so much work to do. What am I gonna do that? It's not because when it comes to actually getting help, support, you never know what conversations are happening about what things are gonna get funded, who's gonna do what, you don't, you aren't in all those conversations. But if they're talking positively about you because they know you, they like you, they trust you, they want you to be around to help them. They know that you're going to solve their problems. They know they can count on you. They know who you are. Those are the things that really, really matter. And it took me a while until I was about halfway through my PMO career before I realized how much that really mattered. And it, in most organizations, I don't know, actually, I don't know a scenario where it wouldn't be, but in the, all the organizations I've worked with, that has been a huge factor, a huge differentiator. And same for my students, and it sounds like same for you guys as well. So um, again, value bomb you guys are throwing out there. Relationships matter so much and will make a huge difference in what you're able to accomplish. So that is awesome. Okay. okay. Sorry, one, one yeah. word I have to sum all this up is the yeah. word I use a lot is being prepared. By doing yeah. that networking you're for your career, or for your project or whatever, you're being prepared because you don't know what's going to come in front of you as an opportunity or as an issue. So prepared mm -hmm. is, is the word I'd like to put out there with, with and ending with that comment. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead, Marcel. 
And I, I guess you always get down to, to people, right? And uh, it, it does. Uh, one thing that I love to, to tell my, my students as, uh, as mentoring people here at Timber is uh, uh, the story of the St. Louis Bridge. I won't get into that and the elephant and everything else. But what I tell them is that project management is not about building uh, bridges from one side to the other of the river. It's about bring, building bridges between people. Yeah, exactly. So you always need to build those bridges and, and we need to maintain those bridges so we yeah. can always assess them. And uh, it's always get down, gets down to people, talking right. with them and have a very good relationship. I couldn't agree more with you. That's great. And that's a really great way to kind of wrap up all of this. So I'd like to shift here and ask one more question of each of you to just give our audience a next step. One of my... Um, one of the things that I believe in very strongly is that there's a lot of information out there, like we've talked about, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of people watching this session will be watching a ton of different sessions. And I believe it's super important to not just hear this information, but have a plan for taking action on what they're learning and to go do something with what they're learning. So here's your opportunity to share with the audience what is the one thing that they can go do to take action, to do today, tomorrow, over the next week, to take action on the guidance that we've given them, either things you've said here or something else that you think is really important in the context of talking to PMO leaders and you know, they want, they want to know how to earn their seat at the table. We've given them a lot of really great advice, but right now during this pandemic, there's a lot of change happening, a lot of chaos, and not all of the PMO leaders listening, and even the ones that do, could probably use a little bit of guidance on what do I do to really be seen, be understood, We'll talk about whether or not you should sell the value of PMO in another session I'm doing with some awesome thought leaders in this space. So stay tuned for that one. But in this session, what can you guys tell them they should do to be recognized by their leadership, earn their seat at the table and be recognized by their leadership as uh, a true strategic business partner when they're PMO leaders? Uh, Michael, I'll start with you. Sure. I, I, so I think uh, just hearing that and what pops into my head right away is what is your elevator speech? Mm -hmm. Who are you? What do you stand for? What, what is, uh, what is your personality? Um, where do you want to go? Right. So if, if, if uh, you know, and I have had this happen, but I haven't used it, but if you run into the CEO somewhere, could you give that elevator speech as to here's what I'm working on? Here's where I want to go. And here's kind of my philosophy. Um, that sounds really easy, but I put that together. That takes a lot of time. It's taken me years to put together. It does. Have an elevator speech that I that I could give someone if they were to ask me. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think you really have to sit back and say, you know, what is it I'm doing? Why am I doing that? Um, and, and where do I want to go? And and that's those are big questions. Each one of those we could dive deeper into. But I but I think from a top level, something to take away. I think it's having your elevator speech and and being able to give that anytime, any place as to why are you as a PMO leader and, and what is it you want to get out of it? And what would you tell a senior leader if you have the opportunity to meet with him or her? Right. Oh, that's great. All right, Marcelo, what do you what do you have to say? I, I need to say that I, I just remember a beautiful story of our foundation because it, it was a sales pitch. OK, so um, we need to say that you need to be ready so you can be lucky. Mm -hmm. Oh, so our so our founder, Osiris Silva, uh, he was ready. He, he got his sales pitch. Mm -hmm. And then the president of the country uh, was going to land in an airfield near here. Uh, but then there was a fog there mm -hmm. and uh, he couldn't land there. And then he needed to land the, to the closed airfield and, and he landed here. By chance, he was the officer in charge that day. Mm -hmm. and he needed to talk with the president <laughs> and he had his sales pitch. And 51 years later, here we are. Wow, that's cool. So uh, have big dreams with your sales pitch as well. So mm -hmm. dream big. Uh, that 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 could happen anytime. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's great. Um, and so my last piece of advice, kind of wrapping all of this up, would be um, taking what you guys have said with respect to having that elevator pitch available or knowing what you stand for. Um, my advice to all of you listening is that when you talk about 
who you are and what your PMO stands for, you're doing it from a place of service where you are very clearly connecting what you do to the pain points that the business has. So if, and what that means, you have to know them. You have to know them just as much as you want them to know you. You have to know where the, what's keeping your executives up at night. You have to know where the pain points are in the, uh, in the organization. Not just what you see as the problems, because if they don't see those things as problems, it doesn't matter if you see them. It has to be the things that they know they need help with, that they know are pain points, the things they complain about, start there. That's where you start showing value first. And you talk about what you do in terms of how you solve that problem. The with them, the what's in it for me is what you want to be focused on in your conversations. And I can guarantee that these two gentlemen, when they talk to people about what their PMO does, they don't say we provide a bunch of templates, tools and process because there is no executive out there that is going to say, hold on, wait, come back when you've got five more templates for me to fill out. They don't care about that. They care about you helping them achieve the outcomes. And that's exactly <laughs> what you do when you talk to your business leaders. You say, hey, you know that pain you're experiencing? This is what we do to solve that pain and what the world looks like when we've solved that pain for you. We don't talk about the PM speak. We don't talk about you know how the sausage is made. Nobody needs to know that. They just need to know, here's the pain. Here's how we solve that pain, high level. And then the outcome and the way that's going to make a big impact on you and the organization, make their lives simple, solve problems, and you will earn your seat at the table. And I think that kind of wraps up all this beauty, these value bombs that these wonderful gentlemen have been sharing with you today. All right. Well, with that, thank you, Marcelo. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, you. Erico and the entire PMO Global Awards team for having us here today. Uh, we'll all be in the app, right, guys? We'll be in the app if people want to chat with us and ask questions. Okay. And you can certainly learn more about me um, on our um, exhibitor page from PMOstrategies.com. Send me a message. Send all of us messages. Ask questions. We'll help you with anything you need. We're grateful that you took the time to spend with us. And uh, we look forward to supporting you make a bigger impact with your PMO. Yes. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Americo. Thanks, Marcelo. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you, Americo. Bye.